508 BC, five centuries before the birth of Christ. In a town called Athens, a tiny city in mainland Greece, pandemonium ruled the streets. The ordinary people had turned on their rulers, demanding freedom from centuries of oppression. At this moment, one man looked on, an Athenian nobleman named Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes had been brought up from birth to be a ruler, to look down on these common people with contempt. But this one night would be a turning point. In his life, in the history of Greece and in the history of civilization. In a flash of inspiration, Cleisthenes would see that these ordinary people should have freedom, a chance to shape their own destiny, to govern themselves. And with this decision, Cleisthenes would set his fellow Greeks on the path to empire. Historians estimate that Cleisthenes was born around 570 BC. He was hardly the type to become a man of the people. From his earliest days, he had been taught that he was an aristocrat. Ancient Greek for a member of the ruling class. In the sixth century BC, these aristocrats controlled everything that happened in Cleisthenes' hometown, a small settlement called Athens. Athens lay in the center of a Mediterranean peninsula which Cleisthenes knew as Hellas, and which we now call Greece. And this was no society of equals. The common Athenians lived under the rule of the aristocrats, men such as Cleisthenes' father. For the Greek writer Aristotle, this was a world riven by injustice. The whole country was in the hands of a few people. The hardest and bitterest thing for the masses was their state of serfdom. Not that they weren't discontented with anything else, for to speak generally, they had no part nor share in anything. Dominated by aristocrats interested only in preserving their own power, Athens hardly seemed a state on the verge of building a great empire. Greece was divided into countless tiny nations called city-states each fiercely independent, each with its own culture and history. And Cleisthenes Athens was not nearly the most powerful or important of these tiny nations. Argos had stood for over a thousand years. The Corinthians dominated Greek trade. In the south of Greece, around the reed beds of the river Eurotas, lay the city-state of Sparta. The Spartans were brought up from birth to be soldiers, raised in the field, separated from their families, their lives structured around discipline and war. The Spartans lived a life stripped of comforts, with few possessions apart from their weapons and their cloaks dyed red to conceal their or their victim's blood.
There's a big change in the middle of the sixth century when one man seizes control of the government as what the Greeks called a tyrant. The story of how this tyrant or sole ruler came to power has been preserved by the historian Herodotus. One day, a man of dignified and noble bearing rode into the city of Athens. Beside him stood a tall and beautiful woman. A woman he claimed was the patron goddess of Athens, Athena. This dashing figure demanded that he be given the rule of Athens. Surprisingly, he was welcomed by the Athenians as their new ruler. Despite the fact that the goddess was simply a particularly tall girl from a neighboring village. And the heroic figure was an ordinary man called Pisistratus, Pleisthenes' own brother in law. But as he consolidated his rule, it became clear that Pisistratus had far greater ambitions than simply gaining power. Pisistratus was an extremely intelligent man. He clearly understood that if he was going to maintain control of Athens, if he was going to be able to consolidate his rule and pass it on to his sons, which is clearly his ambition, he would have to find allies. Pisistratus took an extraordinary step. He turned to the common Athenians for support undermining the whole hierarchy of aristocrats and commoners that had endured for centuries. Isistratus reduced taxes and introduced free loans to allow the people to build up their farms. And by offering the Athenians the chance of prosperity, Isistratus began to transform his city. Cleisthenes grew to manhood under Pisistratus' rule. And he saw how Athens changed. His home had turned from a modest rural settlement into an international economic power. But Pisistratus' rule of benevolent tyranny was not to last forever. In the year 527 BC, he died and was laid to rest here in the Athenian graveyard. His son, Hippias, took over. At first, Hippias followed in his father's footsteps, ruling Athens with a fair hand. But soon, the Athenians discovered the perilous nature of tyranny. Historians tell us that in the year 514 BC, Hippias' brother was murdered. Aggrieved and bitter, the tyrant's behavior completely changed. The freedoms that the common Athenians had gained under Pisistratus were now stripped away. Pleisthenes assembled a conspiracy to overthrow the tyrant. Hippias was trapped in his stronghold, captured and banished from Athens forever. As soon as Cleisthenes gained power, he found that others were conspiring against him. 
The most ambitious of those conspiring against Cleisthenes was a man named Isagoras. Isagoras was another Athenian aristocrat. But Isagoras also knew that he could not gain power on his own. Isagoras took an unprecedented step. He turned outside Athens for support. He sent a message to the Spartans, Greece's most feared warriors. The Spartans immediately provided a force of their finest troops to back up Isagoras' bid for power, to help him betray his city. Isagoras really was upping the stakes. He brought in the most powerful state in Greece. It was pretty clear he was going to turn Athens into a subject state to Sparta. With his Spartan force, Isagoras staged a coup, seizing control of Athens. The first targets of the new tyrant were the other aristocrats. Cleisthenes, most of all. Over 700 households were cast out of Athens, including Cleisthenes and his entire family. Cleisthenes would leave his city, living once again under the hand of a despotic dictator. A dictator who now ruled with the support of the most fearsome power in Greece, the Spartans. For Cleisthenes, all his childhood lessons seemed betrayed. He had been brought up to be an aristocrat and a ruler. to emulate the mythical heroes. But all this had led to was conflict and feuding, death and exile, power struggles amongst an aristocratic elite. How could Athens ever escape from this pointless cycle of violence? But even as Cleisthenes agonized in exile, Athens was rocked by an extraordinary event. Like their mythical heroes, the ordinary people of Athens now took their destiny into their own hands. Isagoras and his Spartan allies blockaded themselves atop the Acropolis, the high point of the city. But even there, they could not escape the fury of the common Athenians. For two days and nights, Isagoras held out against this extraordinary uprising. Until finally, on the morning of the third day, he was forced to surrender. For the first time in recorded history, the people had turned on their rulers and seized power for themselves. At this new dawn, the Athenian people now turned to one man. A figure whose life, whose experiences and disappointments had given him a unique vision. Cleisthenes was recalled from exile 
when asked to build a government. For Cleisthenes, the problem was how to give his fellow Athenians the say in their future that he knew they must now have. On an Athenian hillside, he had a great meeting place carved out from the bare rock. Here, in the shadow of the Acropolis, the citizens of Athens could now gather to discuss the future of their state. On these very steps, rich and poor alike could stand and address their fellow citizens. Cleisthenes instituted the simple vote. A white pebble for yes, a black pebble for no. And with this elegant and simple idea, Cleisthenes instituted the rule of the people. A system of government which we now know as democracy. The great Athenian assembly would gather every nine days to vote on issues covering the entire administration of the state. From the raising of taxes to the building of roads. From the price of figs to the declaration of war. It was a system of government that would transform this tiny state and would set off one of the greatest flowerings of civilization the world had ever seen. <laughs>